Thank you. So if we look at the world's current situation, obesity rates are at an all-time high. Heart disease is still the leading cause of death, certainly in Australia, but also in the majority of the developed world. And the rates of type 2 diabetes are on the rise. And unfortunately, type 2 diabetes, a condition which was previously thought to be a strictly adult condition, is now being seen and diagnosed in children as young as 10, which is quite frightening. Now, the big question is why? And it doesn't really make sense because despite all of the millions and millions of dollars and decades of effort that have been invested into preventing and minimising obesity, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, we're seeing the rates increasing, not decreasing. And if we actually start by looking at the current approach, then we might be able to answer some of the questions. So our current approach to preventing heart disease for example, has been focused on stopping particular behaviours. So stopping smoking, cutting down on saturated fat and junk food intake, and reducing salt. Now, most of us have either heard of those things or uh, for those of us who have partners or parents who have too much of one or the other, we're constantly nagging them and telling them to stop, slow it down, because that's the way that we have seen uh, has been taken to try and prevent things like heart disease and obesity. But if we actually have a look at a recent statement from the US National Institute of Health, they have stated that coronary heart disease, the number one cause of death among adult men and women, is more closely related to low birth weight than to known behavioural risk factors. So what that's saying is that if you're born a low birth weight, that is more closely linked to you developing coronary heart disease as an adult than smoking, eating too much salt, eating too much junk food. So surely, if the US National Institute of Health is coming out and saying this, there's got to be more to this. And so to start with, I guess I want to talk to you a little bit about what causes low birth weight and what we're actually talking about. It's actually being born at a under two and a half kilos. Now, does uh, being born a low birth weight guarantee health problems, guarantee issues? No, but it is related to higher risks. And some of the causes of low birth weight, most of them tend to be related to the mother's health. So we're talking about poor nutritional status before and during pregnancy, but also uh, smoking, drug use and alcohol use during pregnancy. And there are also uh, numerous other factors and they include multiple births, so twins, triplets, and also teenage mums uh, have a higher chance of having a low birth weight baby. So if we consider this and um, the statement from the US National Institute of Health in regards to uh, the significant impact of having, of being a low birth weight on the potential of de developing coronary heart disease, we need to ask the question, can what happens in this pregnant belly lead to this be a belly? And so the question that it leads us to is, does the answer lie in the womb? If we look at what the scientists have been talking about for actually quite a number of years, there is a particular uh, proposal that's been put forward known as the early origins of disease hypothesis. And that was put forward by Barker in the UK quite a few years back. And it suggests that some answers to chronic disease prevention potentially do lie in the womb and what happens to the fetus during pregnancy. Now this is thought to be through epigenetics. So not a change in the DNA per se, but in the way that it's expressed. So the environment in the womb and the maternal behavior interacting with particular genes and actually switching them on and off, which can have a direct impact on the long-term health of that baby when they grow into an adult. And this is uh, interestingly, um, there is more and more data and I'm going to talk to you and take you through some of this data. So there, are, there have been three key modifiable prenatal factors, so things relating to pregnancy, that appear to shape fetal nutrition and health in later life. Specifically, 
the, the mother's weight immediately before pregnancy, but also how much weight she gains during pregnancy, her blood sugar levels during her pregnancy, and whether she goes on to develop gestational diabetes, which is diabetes specifically uh, related to pregnancy, and also whether she smokes during her pregnancy. Now, the interesting thing if we talk about smoking is that scientists have actually looked at this quite carefully. And in a recent meta-analysis, which looked at 14 different studies and the results from them, maternal smoking during pregnancy was actually associated with a 50% higher risk of childhood obesity. 50%. We're not talking about 1% to 2%. We're talking about a 50% higher risk of childhood obesity if your mum smoked during pregnancy. Once again, as I said before, this is not a guarantee. Just because your mum smokes during pregnancy doesn't guarantee that you're going to develop obesity. But it certainly puts you at a much higher risk if we look at all of the evidence. Now, if I go back to maternal weight gain, specifically if we're looking about weight gain during pregnancy, every pregnant woman should gain weight. And it's really important to emphasize that. However, there is an appropriate amount of weight to gain and then there's all the extra. And unfortunately, what we do tend to see is that more and more increasingly, women are gaining excessive weight during pregnancy. And we need to realize that appropriate weight gain during pregnancy is not just about the woman easily losing the weight, the baby weight after the birth of the baby and looking slim and taut and terrific, but also, and more importantly, it's about the health of the baby into adulthood. And this is really where, where I want everybody to understand and then realize how critical this is. Some of the reasons behind excessive weight gain during pregnancy lies in this wonderful belief and justification that a lot of us uh, certainly in Australia are, are very familiar with. It's the eating for two concept. And I'm sorry to tell you, but it's not quite right. The reality is that the extra energy requirements during the second and third trimesters of pregnancy, which are about 1,400 to 1,900 kilojoules per day, are equivalent to a small tub of yogurt and a banana. <laughs> Not two breakfasts, two lunches, two dinners, half a tub of ice cream and half a packet of Tim Tams. The reality is if we truly do encourage or support or, or go along with the, oh, well, yeah, you're pregnant, you have to eat for two concept, the reality is this is going to lead to excessive weight gain. And as I said, it is not simply that that woman is then going to struggle to lose the weight after the birth of her child, uh, but more importantly, that it's going to have a direct impact on the future health of her infant into adulthood. So the question that might um, rise to you watching is, okay, so does that mean it's the end of the world? If, if, if it wasn't done right in pregnancy, you know, am I permanently damaged. The reality is, as I said, it's not by any means a guarantee, but the relationships are there. There is also some very good evidence from the scientists about what happens immediately post-birth, so in the first few years of life. And it, there's some very clear evidence that appropriate breastfeeding and adequate sleep are also integral to health into adulthood. And certainly there is research linking poor breastfeeding practices and children not getting adequate sleep. So for newborns, it's less than 12 hours a day of sleep. Both of those are linked to higher rates of obesity and chronic disease development into adulthood. So keep it in mind, it's not just what happens in the womb, it is what happens immediately after. So you've seen a lot of these pretty images of, of babies and um, you know very cute little infants, but I want to take you back for a second to our current approach to preventing obesity, heart disease and other chronic disease. It's really focused on an obese, overweight man or woman, asking them to cut down the saturated fat, stop smoking, get off the, off the, off the liquor. And this is, as I said, where have we have been focusing millions and millions, billions of dollars and decades of effort to try and stop these things happening. But unfortunately, the rates are not decreasing. And so my question to you, are we being smart investors? If we are consistently seeing that um, there is minimal positive impact of all of our time, money and energy on reducing the rates of obesity and chronic disease, surely we've got to start thinking differently and putting together different suggestions and investing our money otherwise. So from my perspective, 
I'd like to propose that we invest effort and money in this pregnant belly to prevent this beer belly. Now, fortunately for us, there have actually been, um, there's actually been some modeling done looking at comparing better um, uh, behaviors during pregnancy versus worse and what impact that can have. And if we actually take two mothers, we'll start with the first. It's a mum that smoked during her pregnancy, did gain excessive weight, so was eating for two, enjoying the Tim Tams and the ice cream. Also, uh, with the infant, the infant was not breastfed adequately when it was born and it slept less than 12 hours a day. Well, if we look at all of the evidence that's available, that infant has a one in three chance of being overweight at age three. Now, this picture here, this poor little girl, she is only three years of age and she's that size. And whilst some other pictures, and we're used to saying, oh, it's a cute little fat baby, how adorable. The reality is when we're talking about a child that is that overweight at the age of three, then unfortunately what we do know is a lot of these children grow up into overweight adults. And when I mentioned to you before that we are seeing high rates of type 2 diabetes and they're being diagnosed now in children as young as 10, unfortunately it, it is these children that are developing type 2 diabetes so early on. Now the good news is if we look at the other side and we take a mum that did not smoke during her pregnancy and did not gain excessive weight, so gained an appropriate amount of weight. And I really want to emphasise, it's not about not gaining weight during pregnancy. That is very dangerous and definitely not recommended. By gaining an appropriate amount of weight is absolutely critical. Also, when we look at her infant, the infant was breastfed for six to 12 months and slept at least 12 hours a day. Well, the chance of this child being overweight at age three is one in 17. Now, one in three, versus one in 17, that's a pretty huge difference. And if we actually have a think about what's going on in Australia at the moment, so our obesity and overweight rates, we're sitting close to, you know, 25% of obese, more than that overweight, we're sitting close to this one in three. Now, if we could start shifting those rates to closer to one in 17, we're going to be looking at a much healthier country with a much lower burden of both from a disease perspective, but also from an economic financial perspective. So we really do need to start thinking differently. And my question is in regards to a wise investment. So we're looking at a nine to 12 month investment into the health of the mother, mother to be that may pay dividend with 90 years of health for the offspring. Now I'd like to ask you, do you think that would be a wise investment? I certainly think so. So what I'd like to see is for us to start targeting our money and effort to support smoke-free pregnancies, appropriate weight gain during pregnancy, and supporting women to breastfeed appropriately and enable them to get their children to have adequate sleep. How can we do this? Well, we can start early. We can start by actually educating high school students, not just about sex and reproduction, but about what actually happens in utero and the significance of those particular maternal influences on the long-term health of her infant into adulthood. We also need to empower mother and child health workers to be confident in this area and to be able to share this information with pregnant women and support them to make these positive changes. And as I said over and over again, it really is about emphasising the long-term impact of maternal nutrition on the health of offspring into adulthood. It is not just about that nine month period, it's about what happens for the following 90 years for that child. But those of us that are, that are thinking about it and thinking about it right now, whether you're a father, a partner, a friend, we need to start supporting women to make healthier lifestyle choices. And from a simple perspective, when it's not about buying the pregnant woman tubs of ice cream and packets of biscuits. The reality is we should be looking at investing into healthy foods and supporting them to not only end up having a healthy pregnancy, but also having a child that's going to have a healthy adult life. So the bulging belly does the answer to chronic disease and obesity prevention lie in the womb. Well, certainly if we look at the evidence at hand, it suggests that this might be the right time and the right place to start investing in our women and trying to optimise the health of our future population in a different way. Thank you.